Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we are talking about crayfish with Mael Glan, a PhD candidate at The Ohio State University in the Department of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology. Hi Mel, welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hey, thank you for having me on. I'm super excited about this. Let's start out by telling everyone just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so as you said, I'm a PhD candidate at Ohio State University or the Ohio State University, I think I should say. And I, uh, my research focuses on crayfish taxonomy and uh, systematics with a, an emphasis on crayfish conservation. And I primarily work with crayfish in North America. I've done a little bit of work outside of North America, but really this, this is one of the major hotspots, if not the major hotspot of crayfish biodiversity. So it's really a good place to do this kind of work. Cool. So were you always interested in the outdoors and nature or did you come to this later? Yeah, you know, I think I was, I was always interested in animals specifically. I think when I was really young, I don't know that I was as outdoorsy as I am now, but I was always fascinated by various animals. And I, I think I would go through phases of my life where I would, you know, discover an animal I really liked and try to learn as much as I could about it. And so I had you know, the squirrel phase and the kangaroo phase. And I think, I think that's kind of how I got into crayfish. I, I sort of realized that crayfish existed and it just so happened that crayfish ended up sticking a lot more than the other animals. And, you know, I don't know, 20 years later, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. Cause I went through some of the same phases of focusing on this and focusing on that. And I still do that sometimes, but yeah, I'm really excited about talking to you and learning more about crayfish and everything, because for me, it was more the terrestrial stuff that stuck and the crayfish were fun to catch in the creek and to look at and play with and stuff like that but most of the aquatic stuff never really went further than that for me so i'm excited about getting to learn more about something else that is new for me here today yeah i think you know i think the the creeks can be a great place to learn but it also kind of depends on where you live sometimes it's not as accessible and you know i i think sort of my my I didn't have great creeks where I was for most of that time. I was mostly out in Utah. And I guess a lot of people will listen to this and they'll say there are great creeks in Utah. And there, I, there are for certain things, but not for crayfish. But I guess the sort of surrogate I had was uh, keeping crayfish in aquariums. And that was really, you know, before I knew anything about conservation or knew anything about um, actually some of the sort of bad sides of the pet trade even, I was really interested in keeping them in aquariums. And so I, it was, it made it easier to sort of be exposed to it on a day-to-day -day basis and, you know, having a bunch of crayfish and fish tanks and seeing them crawl around and, and you learn a lot that way. I mean, you really, if you can get them comfortable and get them settled in a, in a, in a natural sort of, or kind of a replicate natural environment, you can learn a lot about them. And I think that's how I, that's why that stuck so much relative to, you know, I mentioned squirrels and kangaroos. I mean, I could watch documentaries about things like that, but I couldn't really have a squirrel. Maybe, maybe I could have if I tried hard enough. <laughs> that's still on the, on the to-do list, I think, but not a kangaroo, definitely. And that is, that is that one-on-one -on -one connection. However you make that one-on-one -on -one connection, I think that really does make a difference. But that was one of the things I was going to ask you. So I've lived in the Southeast most of my life. I visited Utah, um, but that was just vacation a couple of years ago. Absolutely fell in love with the Southern Red Rock area of Utah. That's where I was at. But where are crayfish? I mean, are crayfish everywhere pretty much? I mean, that's, they are in most of the creeks and streams and ponds and lakes that I find around here, but I never really thought to look in the creeks in Utah or other areas I've visited. Yeah, so that's a really good question. There's two families of crayfish represented in, in North America. And most of the crayfish are found east of the Rocky Mountains. We have almost 400 species. We might actually have 400 at this point. It's last time I counted, I think it was just about, just about there. The sort of the major hotspot of biodiversity is uh, in the southeast, kind of around Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. And as you kind of start going out from there, you, you lose the number of species, but you still have, you know, states with 90 to 100 species, and, and many of those are endemic. 
Um, out west, out in Utah and kind of on that side of the Rocky Mountains, you have less species. There's really one dominant species called the signal crayfish that's found in, in sort of most of the Pacific Northwest and, and also it's found inland. There's some discussion about whether there's, you know, subspecies or maybe different species that are part of this crayfish, but it's been, I think it's been pretty hard to pin that down because there's been so many translocations. You know, historically people have moved these crayfish around a lot for, for food, especially out there. Uh, Utah specifically has one endemic crayfish that's really hard to find. I never found it when I lived out in Utah. Unfortunately, what you have now though in Utah is a lot of non-native species that have been moved over. Uh, I think some of them were, were stocked on purpose into some of the reservoirs up in the mountains. Um, another one, which is kind of the, the, the kind of nickname it, the global invasive, the red swamp crayfish, which is the crayfish you think of if you think of eating crayfish, you know, in Louisiana. That one is all over the place and it's also now, I was actually just looking on iNaturalist and you can find it pretty easily now in, in Salt Lake City and kind of the surrounding areas. So, so there are, there is an exciting species of crayfish out there. It's just hard to find especially relative to, you know, when you make your way further east and you can find so many other crayfish species, um, it's a little bit easier out here. <laughs> yes, I bet, especially with the diversity that you were talking about. I can't, it's hard to believe that there's like 90 or so species in the States and like 400, was that 400 just in the Eastern US? 400 total in North America. Okay. But, you know, I don't know the number, but there's only maybe a maximum of five or six species uh, that are native west of the Rocky Mountains. So almost 400 out here and just a few out there. So it's really, there's really a lot more diversity represented on this side of, and in, in this, this particular crayfish family is, is much more diverse than, than, the, than the one out west. Very cool. And most of our listeners are over here with us in the Eastern US anyway. So mm -hmm. that's exciting that we can go out and find these things on too. But I guess we should also mention that crayfish, crawfish, crawdads, mud bugs, freshwater lobster, am I missing any? That's that's most of what I've heard, and that's a really great point. I always start my talks, especially if I'm giving it more of a public present presentation. I always have that a slide where I kind of say crayfish is equal to, and and all these different words for them. Yeah, they're all the same thing. They're all, I mean, they're all closely related to lobsters. You know, the the term freshwater lobster. I don't know if that's very accurate. It's but but it's also not wrong. You know, they, they are very closely related to each other. They just go back some 300 million years. So um, they are very much like a freshwater lobster. I tend, I tend to say crayfish if I'm talking about the animal for research or for, you know, that kind of thing. I think people like to say crawfish a lot for the food item, but it really depends on where you go. And I think everybody can, they all understand we're talking about the same thing, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I usually say crayfish, um, especially if I'm doing more of a professional, like you said, professional setting. But crawfish and crawdad come out of my mouth mm -hmm. relatively frequently as well. And I'm not going to say that I haven't used all three in the same story before. and never even realized I switched between the two, um, between them all until somebody said, hey, Shannon. And I was like, oh, yeah, oops. Oh, yeah. well. <laughs> you know, what's funny about it, though, is that it's really technically it's not wrong because um, I've I've named cray or I've named yeah crayfish. I've given them the common name something mudbug or something crawdad and and you know I think usually when I've done that it's because it's kind of been the trend like mudbug tends to go along with burrowing crayfish which I'm sure we'll talk about just because mm -hmm. you know a lot of people don't necessarily associate what they find in these muddy ditches as the same thing they find in the creek and it is the same generally speaking it's the same animal. Um, a different species, but the same animal. But yeah, some of these, I mean, I think really you can use whatever term you like. I will say one of the places, I'd say the only place it kind of becomes a little bit contentious is people trying to skirt regulations, especially for the pet trade. I've been told many times, you know, we can't sell crayfish in our pet store. And then I look at, I look at what they have in the, in the aquarium, say if I'm a, at a local pet store, I'll look at what they have for sale and it's like, oh, this is a freshwater lobster. And they say, oh, that's, that's not a crayfish, that's a freshwater lobster. And I don't think most of it, you know, probably at that level, it's not on purpose, but you know, it's potentially somewhere along the line, somebody realized, oh, we can't sell crayfish in whatever state. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is tell them that we're sending them freshwater lobsters and that's not banned even, you know, it's so, it's kind of a, 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 a small semantic distinction there, but it, 
it, it does work apparently because people do get around some of these rules. Yeah, not necessarily for the best for the environment in some cases either. Right. I mean, I think that's the idea that if they're banned, it's because we don't want them escaping or being released. And so, yeah, if we're if you try to call it something else and you get around the rules that way, it's it's kind of defeating the purpose. <laughs> yeah, but that's a whole different story that would take. Yeah, yeah we're not going to go there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, you kind of hinted at the reason that really drew me to you to begin with to asking you to be on here is that I was reading some reading an article from the Southern Research Station and saw where you had discovered two new species of crayfish. And as a nature nerd, a nature geek, anytime I see new species being discovered, it's like always, cool, I want to know more and I want to learn more about that. But then in that article, you were talking about how it just really highlighted how much we don't know about nature especially when you can find these two spe new species basically in people's backyards in Alabama and Mississippi, which really resonated with me because that's why I started this podcast is to highlight some of those species that we find in our yards, but also recognize how much we don't know as well. So yeah, tell us the story. How did you find these two new species? Yeah, you know, I think, and I think kind of the way I, I think the best way to start this off is to maybe clarify that a lot of the times when 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 something happens like these two new species being described locals have known about the species for a long time and really what it what it comes down to and i think this kind of gets to your point is that the important or the the sort of the finding really that all it is is a is a formal way of of saying this is what this organism is and so it's kind of making that that bridge between the people who might live in a particular area and maybe just, you know, they don't know, they don't know anything about crayfish, just like, you know, I don't know necessarily anything about particular organisms living in my yard here in Ohio, but maybe I have an undescribed species for all I know. So, so the, the cool thing is making that, that connection where somebody, you can get in touch with somebody who does know something about the organism and kind of work together. And I think that's why this is exciting is that there are so many crayfish in North America that we still haven't put names on and it doesn't mean that they're they're not out there and people don't necessarily know they're there it's just that there's not been a formal study done because it does take a lot of work so what happened with these two particular crayfish which one of which we named the banded mud bug and the other one we named the lonesome grave digger and i can i can tell you why we called <laughs> choose, chose that name um but this is a really cool project this um i'll try to summarize it without taking forever because it's it's just a cool story I was doing some work on this particular genus of crayfish called Lacuni cambaris, which is what my whole PhD has been on. And it's been a, a systematic revision where I'm kind of going through and figuring out, you know, what are the species in this thing? Because it, it's been really a muddy taxonomic history. And there was a particular crayfish in there called the rusty gravedigger. And this, this is a crayfish that's found near Mobile Bay, Alabama, but, but notably it's only been found east of Mobile Bay, so into the Florida panhandle. However, in kind of my you know, my, my various efforts to get specimens for my work, for my genetic analyses, things like that. A researcher, a team of researchers actually, one from Illinois Natural History Survey, uh, Chris Taylor, and then uh, his colleague, Gunter Schuster from Eastern Kentucky University, they sent me some specimens that it, it really just was actually uh, tissue samples, not a full specimen. And I threw them into some of my analyses. And as I started, you know, I, I wasn't focused on this crayfish specifically, but I was kind of just examining the whole genus. And I started taking a closer look and I realized, well, wow, there's a group of crayfish that is, that is you know, this rusty gravedigger that's found east of Mobile Bay. But then a couple of these other specimens that have been sent to me, they're, you know, they look like they're related to the rusty gravedigger, but they're very, you know, as far as genetic distance goes, they're, they're very uh, different, very distinct, kind of off on their own. And I, I started kind of looking at the data for these, these uh, tissue samples, because again, I couldn't examine the actual specimens, which would have kind of given me the answer to the question right away. And I realized, well, wow, these things, what's happening is that they're found on the other side of Mobile Bay. And, you know, Mobile Bay is, it kind of ranges in, as far as its salinity goes, but I mean, it's a very expansive bay. And, and then, you know, above it, you have the Mobile Tensaw River Delta, which is just a network of swamps. And, and it, it, you know, really something that could create a serious barrier for a small crayfish that, you know, would be trying to get across. And so I started thinking that likely what was happening was that the bay and the delta were kind of creating a barrier. And so maybe 
originally a, one species had been found on either side of the bay and then it had been split off. But, you know, we had to go down and, and investigate that. So I, I got in touch with some other people. I worked on this with Susie Adams, who's with the Forest Service down in Mississippi, and then also Dr. Zach Lofman and also Dr. Susie Adams, I should say. But Zach Lofman, who's with West Liberty University uh, in West Virginia and one of his students. And we went down there and kind of started exploring. And basically, we, we started off on the east side of Mobile Bay, looking around there to see really what we were dealing with. What was this rusty grave digger? And then we went, we went on the other side of the bay and started catching specimens there. And, you know, long story short, it turned out that not only was there one new species on the other side of the bay, we also found a completely different thing we weren't even looking for that actually wasn't even really, we would have never known to look for if it hadn't been just stumbling upon it. And at first I was, everybody else thought it was something different. And I was saying, no, it's a color variation. There's only one, you know, I was a skeptic, always trying to be a skeptic. I thought, no, this must be, you know, the same species. And I remember, you know, the, the team, especially uh, Susie Adams, especially was saying, so you still think this is just one species? And I, th I remember saying, yeah, it probably is. And then, you know, we got enough specimens, we got the genetic data and stuff. And it was, oh, yeah, this is clearly two different species. And so, yeah, we described them both. And, you know, I think that was what was really exciting was that these cravish have been there for forever. I mean, for probably millions of years, and no one has put a name on them. But again, it's, people have probably found them and probably have known about them, but it was just making that connection, getting the right people down there who would formally describe it. So that's, that was really exciting. That is exciting. And it's also really important because as scientists and conservationists, we can't protect something that we don't know exists. So if we think that, oh yeah, this is all the same species, you might not be as worried if a few of them start to disappear, but if you realize it's three different species, then you've got three different organisms that you need to think about differently in the conservation efforts. Exactly. And I think that's really the, that's, you You really hit the nail on the head there. That's the motivation behind what I do, because I, I tell people that I, I work in conservation and they kind of look at my work and they say, well, it looks like you work more in tax, taxonomy or genetics. And I, I say, yeah, I mean, there's many different ways that you, you can approach conservation. You know, the other big one, which is, is very similar to what you said, but a little bit different nuance is, you know, if you have a single widely distributed species, you're not likely to do anything about it if it starts, you know, kind of dwindling in a particular area. But if it turns out that you have many different species, all of a sudden you have much smaller ranges and it really does matter more if each one um, needs to, you know, each if one in particular starts kind of, uh, the population decre starts decreasing, it really does matter that you you know, you have to protect that one. So definitely important to, to, to have a good grasp on biodiversity to really inform conservation efforts. And I love the fact that now with the technology we have, you don't have to be a scientist necessarily to be able to do some of this stuff or to help with this. I mean, you can be a normal homeowner or for me, a when it comes to curry fish and stuff and what's in the Greek, I would be a normal homeowner, even though I do know my plants, even though I am a wildlife biologist, I know my birds and my mammals and stuff like that. I don't know anything really about crayfish diversity or anything like that. That's just not my strong point. But if I start to see and share what I'm, not, what I'm seeing with other people, somebody like you can come in and go, that's different. Let's talk. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think that's really cool. And what's especially important about it is that it's not sort of some, you know, the input from homeowners or from locals is not just kind of some noise that we're sort of, you know, trying to, we're paying some attention to, but really it's kind of annoying. No, it's actually a primary part of this process is, is really seeing what people who are on the ground and know the area really well, what they are finding and working with them and, and you know, gosh, they, they might not, not have a, a formal education pertaining to a crayfish or a fish or whatever it is, but they, they know more than, than me if I'm going down there and they can, I mean, I can't tell you how many times either using iNaturalist, which is a huge tool nowadays, or even just going down and, you know, before COVID, going and, and stopping at the gas station and asking around, hey, have you guys seen, you know, colorful crayfish or have you, you know, what's a good creek because the one we were at wasn't good. What's the one that has crayfish? I mean, almost every single trip uh, that that comes up, and it's super helpful. I mean, it's it really is 
I wouldn't be able to do what I do without input from a lot of people who aren't scientists. Yeah, and there's always people that know more than you. I mean, I've had ornithology. I'm a, I'm a pretty decent birder. I've done bird banding. I do all that stuff. There are people that I know who are much better birders. They can hear just the tiniest bit of a bird song and say, that's what that is. And I'm like, uh, okay, if you say so. And they've never had any formal training. It's just a passion of theirs. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, obviously, I'm, I believe in education and formal education because I'm, I'm about to get my PhD. But a lot of what I know and a lot of what I rely on is, is not stuff that I've been able to learn, you know, in, 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 my, in my, either my master's or my PhD. It's really, I think degrees like that are really helpful for learning statistics or maybe various kinds of computer programs analyses. But I mean, I, I've never had a crayfish class, you know, in, and, and I know there are some, I know Zach Lofman at West Liberty University now is, will do some crayfish classes and he'll also do one for the Fish and Wildlife Service. But you know, for me, no one's ever sat me down and taught me about crayfish. Everything I've I know about crayfish is 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 learned in the exact same way as the public in the way that we're talking about. You are passionate about something, and you you go out there and you learn about it. And granted, I have access to probably some more resources because I I'm I work at a museum. We have a lot of specimens. I can dig in a little bit deeper. But I've never had you know a formal education in this stuff. You just have to learn it. And so I think what's really important there is that my education in that realm is no different than the non-scientists. And, and I hate even making that distinction because to me, they're, you know, they're, they're just as much scientists as me. They just don't necessarily have the training to take it any, to take it further and actually describe the species or do the genetic analyses and whatnot. But I mean, I really, all that to say, I really value the input from people who we might, well, I don't want to say who we might, not pay attention to because I always do pay attention to them, but I know some people would think, oh, well, they don't have a PhD or they're not a scientist. I couldn't care less about that. They, because I know that I learned the way that they learned. And so we have, as far as I'm concerned, we have the same sort of level of, of interest and passion and that takes you really far. Yeah, I love that. So how do you tell one species of crayfish from the other? Because, and, and, and this kind of gets into something else that I was going to ask you about, because I went to your website and you've got beautiful pictures of these two new species that you've described. And I have, I'll have links to your website and the show notes for everybody else to go and look at. And I highly encourage all of our listeners to go and look because they are amazing. They're like, once it's turquoise blue and it's got golden yellow bands on it with bright red highlights. And the other one's got some more of this mossy green color and a little bit less of the turquoise. They're gorgeous looking. And I'm like, I've never seen anything that looked like that. All the crayfish I pull out of our creek are this mud brown, reddish <laughs> creek bottom color. And I mean, what do you yeah. do? You give them a bath first, or <laughs> do they actually look like that? So you know, I'll, I'll answer your question kind of because you asked how to identify crayfish, and I'll, I'll answer that. But then I'll talk about the the coloration because that's also really interesting. Most frequently, the way we, that we identify crayfish is using the uh, sexual characteristics. We, we, they have, crayfish have what we call gonopods, and they vary a lot. Crayfish, especially in the, in the family that we deal with, mostly in North America, they male crayfish cycle between a uh, reproductive and a non-reproductive form. And when crayfish are in that reproductive form, their uh, secondary sexual appendages are very distinct. And it's the way that their reproduction works, the, it kind of is like a lock and key. And so the key has to be just right to, to fit in. And so, you know, we can really look at a lot of fine details of, of that. And so that's what we primarily use. You can, you can do that in the field. I mean, some of them are very, very detailed and it really requires a microscope. But for most species, you can get a great idea of what you're looking at just in the field. I mean, not even, you don't even necessarily need to have any sort of, of loop or anything like that. You can just look at it and get a good idea. So they are, they are quite distinctive in most cases. There's some exceptions where, where it can be confusing or where you have some convergent evolution that might make things kind of tricky to figure out. What we're using more and more, and I shouldn't say we're using it more and more, I think it's just becoming more accepted. Um, getting to your other question, color but especially color pattern is really something that people are realizing is helpful. And I think it's something that people have always done. I mean, you know, it, it, not just in crayfish, we, you go out birding, you know, you're, you're looking at color patterns and there's distinctions or differences in the color. 
Um, there was a really great paper that came out by uh, Gunter Schuster, who I mentioned earlier, who's now retired from Eastern Kentucky University. And he's actually also the person who took most of the photos you'll see on my website if they're, if they're you know, some of these really nice dorsal shots. But he, made, he really made the case, and I think it was really important that somebody made that case, because I think some people were maybe afraid to, to say it, and, and he had the, the credibility to go out and say it. But he, he really made the case that color pattern in crayfish is a huge character that we shouldn't be overlooking. And so you can look at crayfish, and you'll see maybe the ones on my website, for example, the number of stripes or bands or you know, the, the, where the highlights are. Are, they, are there highlights on the claws or are there highlights on the body? Those are really important characters. The color itself, so whether the band or the stripe is you know, yellow or golden, that varies a lot. So maybe it's a little bit less reliable as a character, but the, the color pattern is really important there. And so... Yeah, that's something that, that's really becoming important for uh, crayfish taxonomy. The one downside which makes it hard, and I think why it's taken a while for it to be kind of accepted, is that crayfish, when you preserve them, and you, we preserve them in, in ethanol, they turn kind of light yellow white. So they lose all the color patterns. So that's why it's kind of tricky and why the gonopods, which are the sexual uh, characters, are a little bit more useful in the long run. But yeah, so that's that's kind of what we'll primarily do. There's other various things we can do, but that's kind of the main lines of, of evidence, I guess, for identifying crayfish. So it's not something that I could like go out to the local creek or pond and catch a crayfish and take a picture of it and post it on iNaturalist and say, what is this? Well, you could in a lot of cases. I mean, you could because you would still be able to see you know, the color pattern, you could see the, the shape, you know, you don't have to just look, maybe I made it sound like you just have to look at the sexual characters, but I mean, we, we use all sorts of things. We can look at the shape of the claws, the shape of the, of the body. I mean, there's all, I'm, I'm avoiding using technical terms because I want to kind of go and list off, you know, a list of things, but yeah, you can look at a crayfish more often than not. You can look at a crayfish and identify it. I think it gets tricky again because crayfish, for example, can lose their claws. And so if you have a crayfish that has two regrown claws, they're going to look different. And so you might be missing some of the characters. And in fact, you might not realize that their claws are regenerated and you might think that it's a different species because the claws are smaller or more slender or something of that nature. So yeah, we can, I mean, I, I go on iNaturalist and I spend quite a bit of time identifying crayfish and I, I almost never have a good picture of the, the gonopods, which I mentioned, um, which I would usually want for myself if I was in the field. But, you know, you can at least, you can almost always get it down to the genus level, and more often than not, you can get it down to the species. You're also, you know, you can also use kind of the geographic location, although, you know, crayfish get moved around. But, you know, I think really some of, some of them, however, you get into these species complexes where there's some uncertainty about whether there's a subspecies here or subspecies there. That's when you really do need to start relying on some of these more fine scale characters and iNaturalist or, or, or just a photo identification can only get you so far. Yeah, that's the problem with a lot of things is that there's all these other subtle characteristics that just a regular picture can't get you. Sure, sure. But but I but I think in most cases, I mean, I guess what I what I hope to I hope I hope I'm not scaring away anybody who wants to identify crayfish because it doesn't require that you sit there with a microscope and look at 50 individuals. I think some of them you're going to have a hard time identifying just like anybody would have a hard time identifying, but this isn't this doesn't require years of training to just identify sort of the common species. You know, you might get hung up somewhere if you find kind of a funky looking crayfish but everybody gets hung up you know I get sometimes I see a crayfish on iNaturalist and I think what is that thing and you know I can usually figure it out or I'll ask for a better photo and I'll be you know I'll, I'll, I'll say exactly what character I want to see and if the person still has the crayfish they'll send it to me but yeah they aren't something that you know I don't I'm trying to think of an example there's groups of organisms that you know nobody can identify even the experts it's just so hard this isn't it you can you could totally go out in your creek and identify the crayfish that you find you might just need a little bit of help to get started okay yeah so what pictures should you take if you're trying to figure it out there's a really good guide on iNaturalist and maybe what we can do is I can find it and I can link you or I can give it to you to link to it okay. because there's a guy in Texas, Dan Johnson, who is uh, really great at crayfish taxonomy and he's very meticulous about the details of what it takes to identify a crayfish. He asks for 
like I mentioned, the gonopods, which are the sexual characters of the males, especially in a reproductive male, if you can, it's not as helpful if you have a non-reproductive male. And then, you know, a good dorsal shot really helps. If you can see kind of the top of the crayfish, you can see the top of the claws, you know, also trying to get the crayfish washed off, trying to clean it up a little bit. It doesn't require like a toothbrush. It just requires, you know, if it's covered in mud, take it to the creek and rinse it off real quick. Um, that can help a lot. But, you know, there is a good guide and I think it'll be more helpful if, if we link to it because people can really see what characters are useful. Yeah, that sounds good too, because I need to, I, I'm one of those, I'm a visual learner. I like to see things. With yeah. And so, yeah, being able to see what, what to look at would be helpful. Yeah. And, and the gonopods, I would think would only get you so far because because not everything's a male and not everything's a reproductive male. So it seems like that would be a, even though it seems like it's a key characteristic, it's in a relatively small percentage of the organisms. I mean, that's, that's exactly it. And that's one of the, you know, crayfish taxonomy is, is quite difficult because we often struggle to come up with a good character for a non-reproductive male or for a female. And, you know, we doesn't mean that we don't try when we're describing species, but I know I've had a couple of species where I just don't have a good character other than maybe the color pattern, which, you know, crayfish color pattern is consistent. There's not, you know, dimorphism typically in the color pattern. So if you can find something other than the gonopod that like the color pattern that is also found in females, that, that could be helpful. A lot of the characters of the claws, for example, will typically translate fairly well. There is variation in claw size between males, both reproductive and non-reproductive and females, but for example, the presence or absence of bumps or spines, I mean, it might vary a little bit, but you could typically find characters that'll also be found in females and non-reproductive males. It's tough though. I mean, we, you know, I think a big struggle even in my work is I'll find different clades of crayfish using genetic data, using really reliable data. And then I'll look at the specimens and it's, it's hard sometimes to find that magic character. It, it's one of those things where I think where if you look at enough specimens, you kind of get it and it's hard to put that into writing. It's like, I can, I can tell them apart because I have them here and, and maybe I can see different, you know, color variations or whatever that help me to tell them apart. But I, I don't know how to write that down. And I don't know how to, you know, it doesn't necessarily work with any given specimen that you might catch in the field. That's, that's a big challenge. And it's, I can, I've spent many long days in the lab at the microscope, just trying to find that magic character. And sometimes it doesn't work that way. You know, it's, it's not always easy. <laughs> yeah. So we've talked a little bit, you mentioned burrowing crayfish, and I've been talking about creek river crayfish and stuff like that. And like on our property, we do have a creek that runs through the property. And I'm still the big kid that has to go play in the creek <laughs> and flip the rocks and look and see what's under there and catch the crayfish and look at them. Then we also have a man-made pond on the property that the previous owners put in. And occasionally I'll find chimneys there, the crayfish chimneys. And I never really thought about it, but are those different species, even though the pond's like pretty much right next to the creek, are we looking at different species? What, what different types of crayfish do we have? Yeah, so this is, and I'm glad you bring up burrowing crayfish because I, I wanted to talk about it in the context of color um, and I'll explain why, but that it really does matter. The, I think that the sort of bottom line here is that all crayfish can burrow to some extent. So if you go out in the creek, you know, you'll find crayfish under a rock or under a log. They are making a rudimentary burrow. It doesn't really, it's not very impressive. It's not, you know, extensive. Um, and in fact, when I've gone scuba diving in the Atlantic off of Maine and um, looked at lobsters, they are also burrowing in soft sediment in a very similar way as crayfish do. What's special about what we call burrowing crayfish is that they have sort of taken the burrowing to the next level. So crayfish you know, are aquatic organisms, I think, by definition. But burrowing crayfish have sort of, some of them, I should say, have sort of pushed this to the point where they can almost live away from water. They still need water to keep their gills moist, and they still need water for, for the development of their eggs. They still just need it to be pretty moist, and, and, and they can't do that completely in the air. So what they've what they figured out how to do some of these crayfish is burrow away from any open source of water. So, you know, you'll see burrows on the bank of a pond or of a river, but some of the burrowing crayfish have figured out that if they go far enough away, but they stay in an area where the water table is still pretty high, they can burrow down to the water, um, to the groundwater, kind of like they're digging a well, and they'll live their entire lives in that burrow. Occasionally, they'll dip down into the water in the burrow, especially if something's trying to get after them but they'll kind of hang out most of the time around the 
interface of the air and the water. And they'll actually also come out on land and they'll forage occasionally or they'll look for mates. And so, and then, you, you know, you kind of have a whole spectrum in between. So I describe sort of the extremes where you have some that live in water, some that live almost independent of water, except for what's in their burrow. And then you have things that might live in a burrow, like you mentioned, along a pond, that they might spend some time in the open water, some time in the burrow. But we really do have variation there um, as far as what species exist in each of these different environments and the adaptations that they have. So a true burrowing crayfish, for example, is going to have a different morphology. It's going to be compressed. It's not going to have as many spines. Its claws are going to be much more powerful so that it can cut through roots, for example. Whereas a stream crayfish will typically be more streamlined. It might have more defense mechanisms for, you know, for fish. The other really cool thing about burrowing crayfish is that they tend to be the colorful crayfish. So when you when you see a crayfish in a creek, it's typically you know brown or green or gray or some other drab color, sometimes with a, with a pattern that helps it blend into the substrate. And that tends to be because these things are hunted by visual hunters like bass or otters or heron or so many other different organisms. Burrowing crayfish, it's not fully understood why they end up being so colorful. I kind of have my own theories, and I think it really comes down to because they're usually in a burrow or covered in mud outside of a burrow, it doesn't really matter if they're, you know, if they're camouflaged per se. And so I think what happens is that some of these colors just kind of come about as random mutations because you do find stream crayfish that are bright orange or bright blue. I think they just tend to get picked off pretty easily. So I think that some of these crayfish, the mutations still come about in the burrow and crayfish. They just, there's not a whole lot of selection against it. And so you end up with, with really colorful crayfish with, you know, some people make the case that maybe it's helpful for visual signaling between crayfish, and perhaps it is, but to my knowledge, no one's been able to really find a good reason other than probably some random mutation and lack of selection against it. No, no, I love that because so often we think about selection for traits, and just as easily it can be just a lack of selection that didn't get rid of the trait, and that's one of the things that it comes through in a lot of different species and stuff like that. I know when I worked at, as a contractor at Mammoth Cave for a while, there was somebody asked me that and I about the cave fish and the cave crayfish down there and why they were white. And yeah, that kind of led me down that whole rabbit hole and finding out more about, yeah, sometimes it's, we don't know why things are that way. And it could just be that there was no reason not to be yeah. that sort of thing or to select against a mutation. Well, and in fact, that's, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's actually kind of what makes me think that that's why burrowing crayfish are the color that they are. You will find pure white crayfish in a stream, crayfish that aren't cave crayfish. Um, you know, the, the commonly found rusty crayfish, for example, that is found, you know, it's invasive in the Great Lakes. I've found pure white rusty crayfish, right? When usually they're greenish and reddish and brownish. And that's exactly the kind of mutation that I'm talking about that's very rare. And in a stream environment, I mean, I found that crayfish, I saw it from a mile away because it was, it stood out so, so clearly. But I really think that that's the kind of thing that then can lead to the crayfish becoming pure white in a cave environment. And sometimes it's, it's costly, it's energetically costly to make, you know, the various proteins that are required to make crayfish or any other organism colorful. And so it might not even, it might actually be somewhat positive selection in that you're saving energy if you're not having to make these complex layers of proteins because the, the crayfish coloration is, is really a network of different proteins and pigments that kind of layer on top of each other and then give the color that, you know, that you see from the outside. And so if you, these mutations will knock out some of the various proteins and depending on which ones are knocked out, you might have a bright orange crayfish or a, a white crayfish or even a blue crayfish. And so I think that's probably what ha what's happening, just like you said, with the cave environment is that there's, it's, it, it might be energe energetically costly, but there's also no reason not to be bright orange or bright blue. And so I think it just stays. And especially in some of these burrowing crayfish, as I mentioned, the true burrowing crayfish that live nowhere near open water, they live in small populations and they're, they're very isolated. And so some of these rare mutations might come about and there might not be a lot of you know, genetic variation. So there, it's, it might just be that some of these rare mutations come about and, and stay in the, in the population. And you know, then we go out and look for them and there's a bright orange crayfish crawling around. So, I mean, with a creek, I can go turn the rock over, grab it, try, put the rock back and look at it. How do you get to the burrowing ones? So this is, it's funny, there's, there's a lot of different 
thoughts on this. And I feel like a lot of the people that I know who work on burrowing crayfish, we all kind of have our own strategy and, and it's almost like a, a little competition whenever we're out in the field to see who can catch the most. You know, I think that the general idea is to try to not destroy the burrow if you can. Um, sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes the burrows are so deep that there's no getting the crayfish out without basically digging. I mean, you could, you could try to dig to the very bottom of the burrow. Some of these burrows can go down, I mean, more than 10 feet. There's records of them going down that far, yeah. And then the other complicated thing is that they're not always just a straight burrow down to the groundwater. Some of them have, you know, various burrows going off in different directions. And there's, there's thought that maybe some of the chambers in the burrow can be used to store food or um, in some cases it could be for rearing young. I mean, there's, it can be quite complex and we don't have a great grasp on it. My way of getting it is to flood the burrow. So, you know, again, these burrows are typically, they, they always have to go down in the groundwater, except in some very, very rare cases. There's one genus of crayfish in North America that is able to survive for quite a bit of time without really any water in its burrow. Um, but most of the time, if you dig a couple of feet in the crayfish burrow, you'll hit water. Uh, what I found is that I can either dig down to that water, which I don't always know how deep it's going to be, or I can, if I have a creek nearby, um, I can go with a bunch of five gallon buckets, I can get a bunch of water and pour it in the burrow until it's, it's basically saturated and the water level is high enough that I can work with it. Uh, what's it, helpful is that a lot of these crayfish burrow in clay, and so it does retain water pretty well. This is very hard to do when you're working in sand or in you know gravel along a creek bed, but then you can basically pump out the burrow as if you were flushing a toilet. You know, you if you have non-permeable soil or, or, or soil that's not, you know, kind of like I mentioned clay, you can kind of use your hand and you can also use a toilet plunger. And I've seen people also use clam pumps, like the, the sort of the, like a tube with a handle that you can kind of slurp out water with. Um, you can basically just slurp it out or you can use your hand and kind of create a current and, and draw the crayfish out that way. It can be really hard though. I mean, it can be really, it can take, sometimes it takes a couple minutes. Sometimes it can take over an hour for some of these big crayfish, especially when you have multiple burrows or multiple chambers and you aren't really sure where the crayfish is. You know, sometimes you'll accidentally knock some dirt down in the burrow while you're trying to get, get in there. And then the crayfish, you know, it'll be basically blocked down there. But really it's, it's easier to show it than to explain it. But it's, think about flushing a toilet, but backwards <laughs> that's kind of how it works so are you talking about when you're filling it with water like you've got the chimney uh -huh. coming up the mud chimney are you pouring it down the little hole or yeah you'll knock you can just knock off the chimney that way because that you know as i mentioned one of the big problems is when you knock dirt into the burrow um it can be really hard to get the crayfish out so you know you'll approach the crayfish burrow Take off the chimney if there is one, because sometimes there isn't one. It may have been washed away in a rain, or, or maybe it just got knocked off by an animal. But you'll, you can basically enlarge the hole enough that you can kind of get your hand in there, pour water in there, and then, and then yeah, it really is the same. I'll wear gloves. I'll wear dishwashing gloves so I can protect my hands a little bit, especially because a lot of these burrows are in uh, roadside ditches with a lot of glass and metal, like metal cans. But yeah, you basically then just kind of, it's almost like a scooping motion. Like you almost have the, the burrow and you kind of scoop up and you kind of try to create a, a pressure. And you, I mean, sometimes the crayfish doing that will, will I guess, annoyed enough that it'll, some species will come out and try to, you know, defend their burrows and you can kind of grab them. But other times, if you really have a good seal and the burrow is in a, is in a clay substrate where you're, you know, any motion you make is really kind of, putting pressure in the water, you really can like suck the crayfish out, truly suck it out where you'll, it'll, it, it really can't, it's not strong enough to fight back against your, your hand motion. It's hard to explain, but it, it, it really does work. And, you know, if you do it well, ideally you can not ruin the burrow. Even if you're going to keep the crayfish as a specimen, crayfish will reuse each other's burrows. And so it's good to, you know, it's a lot of energy to dig a whole new burrow. And so you definitely don't want to if you can avoid it, you don't want to just ruin the whole thing. So I've heard some people call it, refer to it as a noodling for crayfish. <laughs> so you can kind of stick your whole arm down in there and try to get the crayfish out. But it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's for, you know, I've been out in the field many times with people who, who have never caught a burrow in crayfish. And their first couple of, of burrows, they are frustrated, they're covered in mud, and usually they don't have a crayfish to show for it. So it's it's certainly a lot of work, especially when, you know, some of these areas like in Louisiana, well, Louisiana, yes, but I was, the crayfish we talked about in Alabama and Mississippi, you don't know what's in the burrow. It could be 
a water moccasin that's in the burrow, or it could be a trapdoor spider or something like that in the burrow. There's a lot of different animals that go into these burrows, and you know you definitely want to be a little bit careful sticking your hand down in there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely, especially if you've got like water moccasins and stuff around. Yeah. They're not as bad in a lot of places as people think they are, but I mean, they're not going to come out and attack you if you're just in the pond, but if you're trying to pump it out and get, yeah, I can see where they might be a little bit more agitated. Yeah, or, or uh, in Ohio, Massasauga rattlesnakes um, use crayfish burrows as shelter. I mean, that's one really? of them, their, their main places. Yeah, one of the main places that they go is in crayfish burrows. And, you know, I think... On, on a slight tangent here, crayfish burrows are really cool because I'm sure you've heard of gopher tortoises and all the different mm -hmm. organisms that live in gopher tortoises. There's a very similar relationship where a lot of animals that, uh, live in, in crayfish burrows. The, the, the sort of two main ones are, are the Massasauga rattlesnakes and then the nymphs of the Heinz emerald dragonfly. So two federally listed species rely on, on crayfish burrows for a big part of their lives, if not their entire lives for Massasaugas. So, I mean, you find all sorts of things in these burrows and sometimes they coexist with the crayfish and, you know, they sometimes they get, they risk getting eaten by the crayfish too, but there's, it's a very interesting thing. And you do find some, you know, we, we found a, a glass lizard actually in a crayfish burrow and we actually wrote a little paper about it um, on this last trip down in January. So you really do find some interesting things. I've found a snake once, and I can't remember what it was now off the top of my head, but it wasn't a, a water moccasin. But it was really scary to stick my hand in a crayfish burrow. And I, you know, you obviously know that you're not grabbing a crayfish. You have a snake in your hand, and you just, you hope it's not something that's going to hurt you. And it can be a little bit disconcerting. <laughs> I bet, yes. I, and I never would have thought about Mossasaga rattlesnakes because it's, I mean, I think crayfish burrows wet, rattlesnakes dry. And to put those together, I never would have thought about it. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and I'm not really sure, you know, I, I don't really know what they do. I, I don't know if they'll use occupied crayfish burrows or if they'll use them after they've kind of been abandoned. You know, it could be that the, the particular crayfish burrows might kind of start caving in, and so maybe there's some dirt or mud at the bottom of the burrow. You know, as I mentioned, these crayfish burrows do have to go down to the water table, but in different places that water table could be four, five, six feet deep, depending on, on sort of the, the substrate and whatnot. So perhaps they're able to stay out of the water, but some of them also try to eat the crayfish. So they might actually be trying to hunt it. And there are a lot of snakes that eat crayfish. So it's very interesting interactions between these different organisms. Yeah. And to be honest, I think of crayfish role in the ecosystem is they are the decomposers and the garbage pickups, eating all the vegetation and stuff like that. And then they're fish food or duck food or food for something else. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I mean, I think that's, you know, we're kind of getting into a different realm, but it's very important. I, I try to, I also try to stress to people when I talk to them about my research that crayfish, you know, we, we like to throw around a lot of terms like keystone species, but crayfish really do occupy a very important role for the reasons that you just said, right? Because a lot of the foods that they are eating, so they're eating leaf litter, they're eating small aquatic macroinvertebrates, they might eat small fish, I mean really anything that comes their ways, they're, they're opportunistic omnivores for the most part. A lot of those food items are really have a ton of energy, but they're not accessible, the energy is not accessible to a bass or to a, a, a queen snake or an otter, right? You, you don't see a, a an otter munching on leaf litter. And, and so the crayfish really do because they have such high densities, they're found pretty much all over the place in the eastern United States, and they eat all these things, they serve as kind of the, they, they channel the energies, so to speak, between these lower trophic levels and the higher trophic levels, and so many things eat crayfish. I mean, you would be amazed. It's, you could make a, a list. I think there actually is a list of, um, one of my colleagues has a list of organisms that eat crayfish, and it's, it's crazy how long it is. I mean, everything around water or in water tends to eat crayfish at some point in their lives. So that is really their major role is they, they are the food, they are the universal fish food and, and other aquatic and semi-aquatic animal food. We're not the only ones that think crayfish are yummy to eat. Right. <laughs> so we were talking about the burrows. I want to circle back that around there. A minute. And I know this conversation, we've gone in every which direction, but I love it. <laughs> the burrows and the chimneys. Why do they make the chimneys? Do we know? That's a good question. There's different ideas. Some people will tell you it's just kind of the easiest thing, right? Because the chimneys are made up of little balls of mud. And a, one ball of mud is, is kind of the same. It's kind of analogous to the, a shovel full of dirt, right? It's the crayfish goes down in its burrow wherever it's excavating it. 
and it kind of uses its claws and other appendages and kind of gets some mud and it kind of you know squishes it together and pushes it back out of the burrow so one thought is it could be just kind of the easiest thing to do you're you're not going to walk far away from your burrow and risk getting eaten by by whatever's coming by a heron or something so you're going to stick it at the opening of the burrow more recently however there's a, a researcher out of out of auburn his name is jim steckel and him and his team and I, I hope i'm not forgetting other people he's working with but i think he's kind of the lead on that team they've been showing that the chimney will actually potentially work as a chimney it, it might actually be you know, as I mentioned, not all of the holes of a crayfish burrow will always have a chimney. Typically, you'll have two to three holes. I mean, it can range from one to probably 10, depending on the species and the, and the situation. But an average crayfish burrow might have, you know, two, three, four, four openings. And won't, maybe only one or two of those will have a chimney. And it's thought that that's so that air kind of gets drawn into the burrow and it kind of runs down to the bottom of the burrow and then comes back out through the, the hole that has a chimney. And that kind of helps the air go out. So the two thoughts there are that it could be for aeration just to kind of help get, you know, some some oxygen in the burrow. But it could also be to disperse pheromones. And so, you know, because these crayfish, the true burrowing crayfish spend most of their time in their burrows, you know, it's not like they're in an aquatic environment like a creek where they can sort of put out pheromones and walk around and find other crayfish. They're likely to be in a small colony without a ton of different crayfish and so it can help them find each other when they're mating and you know they'll typically mate in the burrows and you know the the females that will have their eggs and they'll the eggs will develop all the way to juveniles in the burrows so it's thought that that could be how they they kind of find each other interesting so is there one crayfish per burrow or a community of crayfish living in each burrow or how does that work yeah typically it's one crayfish per burrow in north america when you find mating crayfish, you'll oftentimes find two. So, you know, during the mating periods, I'll, I'll, it's still not super common, but you'll, you'll oftentimes find a male and a female in a burrow. In, uh, elsewhere, and, and we probably don't want to go on this tangent, but elsewhere in the world, there is thought to be uh, cooperation between some of the burrowing crayfish where you'll find different kind of life stages. You'll find, you know, adults, juveniles, and maybe just newborns. You will find that occasionally here in North America. I think the evidence is just kind of now coming out and it's maybe not happening to the extent as it's happening in Australia, for example. But yeah, generally speaking, it's one crayfish per burrow. So field work, you can imagine if you need to, you know, you base a, a species account or a species diagnosis on maybe, I don't know, if you're lucky 50, 50 plus species or specimens, so that's 50 plus burrows and not every burrow is going to have a crayfish. Some of the burrows might have a snake and some of them might have a spider. And so, I mean, this, this kind of circling way back around now, this is, this is why burrowing crayfish tend to be the crayfish that we're really doing the most. We're, we're finding the most new things about now. We, we tend to have a good grasp on stream species. We're still working on different species complexes and maybe making some changes, but the burrowing crayfish, which is what I work on, that's why there's so much work to be done is because you don't just go out with a net and catch a bunch of crayfish and take them home. I mean, you might be out for, for days or weeks to get sufficient specimens and to get a good grasp on their range and, you know, their habitat preferences and whatnot. Now, I bet that brings up a lot of really good stories, too, about finding stuff because like you said, I mean, not everyone's going to have a crayfish. It could be empty. It could have a snake. It could have who knows what. Yeah. Well, and it can also have a different crayfish. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, I found a lot of weird stuff in crayfish burrows. I found a lot of dangerous things in crayfish burrows and I've gotten cut and poked and, and all of that. I think that the biggest, which I guess isn't, it's not a funny story, but the biggest thing is just, it's hard to find the crayfish you're looking for. And it's also really difficult because you might be in a place where you find crayfish burrows, but you don't necessarily know if there's a crayfish down there. And so it's always kind of a, you know, you have to think strategically when you only have maybe a few days or a few weeks in the field. How do you, you know, where do you put your efforts? This really came up a lot in this trip that for the two species we mentioned earlier, especially for the banded mud bug, which is the, this is the one of the two crayfish we talked about that has the really cool orange band. It's kind of that turquoise color. That was the rarest crayfish of that trip and one of probably one of the rarest crayfish in, in North America now. There's, there are crayfish that have smaller ranges. Some of them might only be found in a particular site or a particular county. The, the banded mud bug we only know from eight or nine sites. And really this area is bound by the, the Pascagoula River in the west, Mobile Bay in the east, the Gulf of Mexico in the south. And then, you know, you can only go maybe 
10, 15 miles north from the Gulf of Mexico, and that's the whole range of the species. And we really struggled to find it because we would find crayfish burrows, but we would find other species, or we would find burrows and they didn't seem to be occupied. And, you know, you might spend two hours on a burrow and you don't know when you should give up because you don't know if the crayfish is just around the corner, you know, the next scoop, you know, the next shovel full or whatever of mud that you're pulling out, or if it's not there. And so, yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's frustrating work and it's, it can, it's kind of like gambling though, because you never really know, you know, you kind of want to keep going because you never really know when you're going to hit the jackpot and get that crayfish. So it's kind of addicting too. <laughs> it has to be a labor of love. It sounds like to be able to keep doing that and keep going. Oh yeah. I think, and I, I think if I were, I'm not really sure the strategy here, but if I were to, in a position where I had students, I would make sure to, to train them so that they could be doing the work and I could be overseeing it. I think if you, if you, you might not, I know some people, I have some friends who've been digging burrows their whole lives and I think it really wears on you. It's, it's hard on your hands. It's hard on your, on your wrist. And, you know, I, I'm exhausted when I'm home from a burrowing crayfish trip and, you know, my, my arms and my hands are totally exfoliated from all the sand and I've got scars from the glass and, I mean, it's certainly, like you said, labor of love. So if people have a creek or a pond in their property, or maybe the county park has a creek or stream, because we're in the eastern U.S., there's usually some sort of waterway mm -hmm. around most of us in our local areas. What, if anything, can people do as far as conservation of the crayfish or even just getting out to see what they have? Yeah, I mean, I think that the best thing to do is to, you know, grab a little net if you have one. It can be a, a little aquarium net or it can be a dip net. And uh, basically just go out and start catching crayfish and follow the regulations. You know, you mentioned the county park. Maybe you're not supposed to catch them. Just, I mean, it's typically you can catch crayfish uh, with a fishing license or most in a lot of places you're allowed to just catch them and release them for fun. But yeah, just go out. And, and as we talked about, using iNaturalist is great because not only do you get the satisfaction of figuring out what you have in your hand and maybe you already have a solid guess and you can, you know, you can say that and then you get confirmation or you might learn, oh, actually, it looks like this species, but it's this one because X, Y, Z. But, you know, you're, so you're not only learning yourself, but you're helping researchers. And it's amazing, you know, you never know how one crayfish that you took for granted might mean a lot for, I mean, it could make or break an entire dissertation. Like for a long time, I was looking for any burrowing crayfish in South Dakota. And I eventually found it. I eventually went out and found it. But it was just a weird historical sort of blip that I needed to find a burrowing crayfish in South Dakota to, to basically round out my entire dissertation. It all rested on this one thing. And, you know, I was checking a naturalist every day and I found other crayfish and, I, and, and there was some interesting stuff to be found. But I was never able to find that one crayfish until I went out there. But it would have saved me thousands of dollars if somebody had gone out, looked for the burrowing crayfish and posted it on iNaturalist. And so, you know, you really can, can learn a lot that way. I don't know about getting burrowing crayfish. I think if you want to learn about burrowing crayfish, you can be brave and, and try to do it. You need to be careful not to sort of, you know, put giant holes in people's property. What can sometimes be helpful with them, though, is if you, if you know where the burrows are, and you have a, you can wait for a rainy night, you know, warm rainy night, maybe in spring or summer, and go out there with a, a flashlight or a headlamp. And if you're really careful and you're really quiet, you might see them at the mouth of their burrows and you can maybe get a quick picture or, or you might see them walking around too. They walk around and you can catch them. You know, you also asked about conservation. I think the big thing is really not moving crayfish around. Most of the crayfish that are problematic in the United States that are so invasive crayfish have been moved around by fishermen for, you know, bait bucket introductions. So, you know, nowadays I think people are starting to kind of wake up and realize they shouldn't be allowed to use live crayfish as bait unless they caught them in that particular water body. But that's a really big problem. And also people who have crayfish for any other reason, for the pet trade or for live food, for example, you know, there's, there's kind of different lines of thought there. But you know, all will agree that you should never, ever release a crayfish. If if you have a crayfish or if you have, a, you know, crayfish that have babies in your fish tank, for example, which happens all the time, you know, don't go and release them in your creek. And, you know, I feel like that should go without saying, but it happens a lot because people don't necessarily know what potential dangers there are. And so um, really just trying to not, not move around crayfish because we really are worried about invasive species as well. <laughs> yes, that's a big problem. And I think it's one that I hope we're learning and getting better at now 
than we were like when I was a kid. And it was just kind of like, okay, that's just a, that's just a crayfish. Yeah. Crayfish are all the same. Right. Or kind of like earthworms. I mean, we're seeing it with earthworms yeah. as well. And I hope that we're learning from our past mistakes and getting better. Well, I think it, you know, I think a lot of it rests on a, on an understanding of why crayfish are important, which we, we talked about, but you know, given that most things in or around water at some point in their lives will eat a crayfish. If you mess up the role of the crayfish there in the community, even if you put in another crayfish, it might not be a direct sort of switch. So, if, you know, for, for uh, anglers, for example, if you like fishing for smallmouth or largemouth bass, and let's say you have a really healthy stream where you have a good crayfish population, if you come in and you bring in, for example, a red swamp crayfish, that crayfish is going to mess up that whole ecosystem. And even though there's going to be a crayfish there, it won't necessarily fill the same role. It might burrow into the banks and cause a bunch of silt and sedimentation, you know, in the, in the stream. If you start understanding, I think, how all these things are connected, it's really easy to find a good reason why you should care and why you should take the right measures. And you'll, you know, you might realize that, yes, you might catch a few more, a few more bass if you have a live crayfish as bait, but you might also in the long run mess up your whole fishery with just a few crayfish. I mean, they're so fecund, they're so, some of these crayfish can just take over in a matter of years. And so it's, you know, kind of up to you to decide what you want, long-term fishing benefit, or you want to catch a fish today. And so I, I think if more people learn about that. And again, it goes back, I think, to connecting with the public in a way that is not scary. I mean, I, I don't, I hate when scientists talk and it sounds like they're, you know, they're talking about something simple and it sounds like they're giving this crazy lecture. I mean, I think just talking to people and explaining why it matters, I think they'll they'll get it more than if you try to lecture them. And that's just not helpful, I, I don't think, with this kind of work. Yeah, nobody likes to be lectured to about anything. No. <laughs> We've been talking for a while and I'll keep going. Uh, I have no problem. I'm, I'm enjoying this. But um, I also want to be cognizant of your time and everything as well. Is there anything else that you want to share with us? Anything that we haven't talked about? Wow. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's really just circling back to, to what we've touched on a lot. I think it's, it's, it's helpful if people, I think there's, there's mutual benefit for people to go out and explore their creeks, not even just for crayfish. I mean, if, if you can go out in the creek and learn a little bit about what's there, and I say creek because I, you know, it could be a river, it could be a lake, a pond, whatever it is. You know, I think that you learn a lot that way. And if you're actively trying to figure out what's going on and using iNaturalist, I always try to tell people to use iNaturalist, you know, you'll learn more, but you'll also contribute to the science. And then I think also for the scientists, you know, understanding that, you know, I'm not one to, we just talked about how nobody wants to be lectured, but I think a lot of scientists still think maybe they don't, maybe they don't, it's kind of a subconscious thing, but a lot of scientists think that they know better than the public. And I think it's really important as a scientist too, to, to listen to the people who are you know, they live in this particular area that you might be studying day to day. And so it's really important to listen to them. And, and so mutual, there's really some mutual benefits there that people, each party can learn and teach the other, learn from and teach something to the other party. So yeah, I would say go out in the creeks, explore, use iNaturalist and be nice to each other and communicate. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. So I got one more question for you. Yeah. Oh, maybe multiples, but we'll, we'll start with one question. <laughs> I know you said you're graduating next year. Yeah. And you're looking for your ne next position. What would be your perfect dream job? I mean, I think the perfect dream job, which is never going to happen, would be something that works specifically on crayfish. You know, I've often I've often wished that I could be an invertebrate curator at the Smithsonian. I, I spent I did a, a fellowship there in 2017 working on on describing a crayfish and you know, that, that's the kind of job that comes about once every, maybe once a decade. And, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily go to a crayfish person, even though there's a big history of crayfish uh, biologists there. Um, I think what I'm more realistically looking for is a, I'd like to work for the federal fish and wildlife system and work on at risk or endangered species or, you know, imperiled species. It doesn't have to be crayfish. I tend to have a soft spot for rare species. I, I really like to work towards conservation. So I, I'm really trying to get a foot in the door with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'm trying to get some fellowships and also applying the jobs that could help me kind of get there. And 
I think it'd be really great to work on conservation plans. And, you know, I, I, I'm a naturalist, but I'm also great with data and, and trying to put everything together and try to see if we're going in the right direction for a species recovery. I think that's sounds really exciting to me. So we'll see. It's tough. It's a tough job market. You know, it's, this is a, it's been really hard for, for biologists. And so I know a lot of people, there's a lot of great people out there who want that same kind of job. And so it's, it's competitive. <laughs> Yes, it is. And yeah, I've got a lot of friends who are graduating from college with wildlife degrees or college degrees and students that I've worked with in the past and stuff like that. So yeah, I know. And I mean, I'm in the field too. Mm -hmm. So I definitely know how competitive it can be. And it's always interesting, though, to hear what different people's dream jobs would yeah. be and how they would like what their next steps are, what they would like to see as their next steps, at least. Sure. So you've given me lots of links. I will make sure I get them in the show notes and everything too, because this is an exciting topic, I think. And I'm hoping more people will want to go and look and see these cool crayfish that you've discovered and learn a little bit more. Maybe check out that link of how to take pictures of the crayfish that they see. If people had questions, or maybe that perfect person's listening that's got the dream job for you, <laughs> how would they get in contact with you? Yeah, so I'm always, I think, hopefully this conversation makes it clear, but I, I love talking to people and, uh, you know, you can, anybody can always contact me. My email address is glon, my last name, G-L-O-N dot one at O-S-U dot E-D-U, or I have my website, myelglon.com, and, you know, you can learn about my research and, and read my, my papers, but I have a, a contact link on there too, and so... Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd certainly say if anybody has even a, a quote unquote stupid question, which I, I think, you know, I'm the first person to ask stupid questions. And I, I think some of those stupid questions are the most helpful questions. But, um, you know, if anybody has any question or any comment, go ahead and, and, and contact me and, you know, we can, we can chat. I'm always happy to. <laughs> yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned a lot as well. And I do encourage any of our listeners to go to Miles page and take a look at it, not only to see the pretty pictures, but if you want to learn more about crayfish, he does have a lot of links to articles and stuff. And many of them are very much general articles for the public. It's not just all of the scientific papers, which he has links to some of those as well. Go to the show notes and there'll be all the information too with his contact information. This has been awesome and so much fun. Thanks, Miles. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. I had a great time, and I hope people learn a little bit more about crayfish from this. Thanks a lot. Well, have a great day, then. Thank you. You too. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. I appreciate Mael taking time to share his knowledge of crayfish with us. I never realized that there were around 400 species of crayfish in North America, and that almost all of those are in the eastern U.S. Like we talked about with the land snails in Episode 8, we always think of biological hotspots as being in some far-off place like the tropics. However, crayfish are another example of how biological hotspots can occur right in our own backyards. I think sometimes it's just hard to recognize or appreciate that biodiversity because to us it's normal and therefore nothing special because we see it every day. I also really enjoyed learning about how many different animals use crayfish burrows. That was eye-opening for me because I've always thought of crayfish as primarily food for something else. I never realized the important role they could play in habitat creation as well. There were so many fascinating topics that we touched on and which I could mention. I really did enjoy this conversation and learned so much. I hope that you did too. I also want to echo Mael's call to go out and explore your creeks, streams, ponds, or other waterways. We're lucky here in the eastern U.S. because bodies of water are pretty common. For most of us, if we don't have access to one in our immediate backyards, then we likely have access somewhere nearby in the surrounding community. I also encourage you to take things a step further, and as you explore, take pictures of what you find and share them on iNaturalist. Not only will you get to learn more about your personal discoveries, but you might help scientists identify a new species or document a species range. And if you aren't familiar with iNaturalist, then I encourage you to listen to Episode 4 to get an overview of the program. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to let you know about my email list. Every week, I send out short emails with links to the most recent Backyard Ecology blog article and podcast episode, as well as any other news of interest. It's the best way to make sure that you never miss anything in the Backyard Ecology world. If you haven't signed up, then I encourage you to do so at www.backyardecology.net 
slash subscribe. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yards and community.